Okay, we have with us in the studio a famous professor of gynecology and obstetrics from the University of Benin, University of Benin Teaching Hospital. is a global professor, uh, I must say. Uh, of course, the founder of the Women's Health and Action Research Center that has been churning out a whole lot as it relates to maternal, newborn, and child health. Uh, I'd like to welcome very specially the Vice Chancellor of Ondo State College of uh, Medical Sciences, University of Medical Sciences. I'd like to welcome very specially our very own Professor, Global Professor Friday Okonofa. Prof, many thanks for joining us on PMI. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm doing well, fine. It, it, it's been a while. The last time I had you on this program, uh, that could be maybe close to seven or eight years ago. Brother. Yes, you're still very much at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital. Yeah. But you still go there for lectures, do a whole lot of stuff. I still like to have that university. Mm. It's been a very well. Okay, let's, let's look at something <coughs> very um, captivating. She did trust you that has to do with uh, improving maternal, uh, newborn, and child health uh, from the perspective of primary health care. Now, some time ago, primary health care was uh, a major focal point in our health policy, in our national discourse. Some say this was really at the forefront with uh, the late Professor Olukeye Ramson Kuti. Yes, what does this, what is this concept of primary health care about? Let's start from there. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, basically the concept of primary health care was designed <coughs> uh, uh, seven years ago to ensure that uh, everybody has access to what I'll call evidence-based care, as distinct from care that has not been, uh, that is not really justified within the scientific system. So what that means is that uh, many of the diseases that we have, uh, about 70% of them, don't have to go to a teaching hospital. Uh, by contrast, uh, the, many of these diseases, problems that we have, malaria and so on and so forth, can be prevented by using simple treatments uh, that are closer to the community. Because the truth is that uh, these days, uh, a lot of our communities don't have, let me say, big hospitals as such, like general hospitals and teaching hospitals. By contrast, the conditions that take them to teaching hospitals can be handled at the level of small cottage health centers. That, uh, and in which case, by even health professionals, that don't necessarily have to be doctors. They can be midwives and community health and senior workers who have been trained to provide evidence-based care. Such that, you know, uh, within the limits of, of time and even resources, every single individual living in the country will be able to access quality health care rather than waiting to build the teaching of the where you will be delayed and cost are expensive and so on and so forth. So the concept of uh, primary care was designed to provide universal access. And more and more, we are seeing that one of the major problems of health care delivery in our country and internationally is the absence of access to health to the majority of our citizens. And that's the reason why many people are dying, where many of these are should be treated early enough. We will wait for a long time, and then only at the very last stage, when the disease can no longer be treated, that we provide treatment. So primary care is a form of care that provides accessibility, affordability, and then evidence that it is effective to the majority of citizens. And uh, I think that Nigeria was right. The Amar Atta Declaration of the Bay which happened in 1978, was what brought primary care into, into the fore. And subsequently, Nigeria adopted it. And Professor Ransom Kutu, as a large nation, took it to its high, highest level of development. But right now, since Kutu died, uh, it's been very difficult. I think that uh, even though our Nigerian government and ministry governments in this country talk about primary care, uh, I don't think they've actually put in a lot of political way to address that problem. So it's still a very big problem today. Okay, so uh, by your analysis, um, most of the diseases, ailments that uh, we take to, that people take to a teaching hospital, uh, they're not supposed to go there. So they're supposed to be domesticated at the rural areas. But the health facilities are not there, just like you mentioned. So what alternatives are there at that level? Let me give an example of a pregnant woman, for example. A woman, I can tell you that 80% of pregnancies are normal. They don't 
need to deliver in general hospitals or teaching hospitals. By contrast, primary health care centers can provide antenatal care. That means that they can see a woman when she's pregnant, you know, ensure that there's no problem, give her routine treatments like immunization, hematomics, etc. And then when she's to deliver, unless, you know, uh, the midwife ordinarily can assess the pregnancy as to determine whether or not uh, delivery can take place safely. And in any case, she can also assess to know if that's very difficult. I mean, only very difficult cases need to be referred to general hospitals. They don't need to come. That's an example of that. Things like immunization of the child, newborn health, you know, uh, weight monitoring, those little things can be undertaken at the level of America that is available in almost every world in many parts of this country. You know, for example, in other states, I'm sure that almost every local government will have at least two or three Americans. I'm aware that, for example, in uh, Ishako, uh, East local government, they have about 26 local, well, uh, they have about 26 uh, primary health centers in 10 wards. That means that at least each ward will have about one or two primary health centers. centers. So we people, if they are well developed, we improve the health care system and people will have access to what I call evidence-based care. By contrast, if you don't have access to primary care, what will people do is not to receive treatment or to receive inappropriate treatment that are not evidence-based. So, for example, that can lead to all our problems, like traditional death attendance or traditional healers that are not able to provide effective health care people. So, if we want the health care system to work effectively, primary health care is, is the answer. Okay. Um, in your opinion, would you say that uh, Access to health is uh, non-existent right now, maybe because of the funding challenges, or where is the problem really coming from? Well, I, I don't want to talk about funding, because I, I, want to, I don't want to say that access to care is completely absent. But I will say that disparity and inequality in access to health and the access to health care, because the rich and those who are very well educated have access. They can go directly to a teaching hospital, or sometimes they go abroad to receive minor treatments, mm. treatment that they can receive. So it is not right to say that there is no health access. The contrary, there is access to the large, to a very significant population of those who are privileged, which is not what social equity talks about. Social equity means that every single person, even in our constitution, you know, the right to health is entrenched in our constitution. Every single person, whether you are tall or black or yellow or whatever. Have the fundamental, the government has a fundamental right to provide access to health to every person in that particular community. So inequity, inequality to access is what is currently happening in the country. And we can improve upon that by focusing on primary care. Because primary care is not at the where you can provide access to the dominant uh, part of populations. And everybody will be very happy. And then the burden of disease and disability will be reduced. What about at the rural level? Isn't funds, wealth, access to wealth, a major challenge in accessing because you find people would rather stay at home, you know, uh, take some um, local herbs and stuff like that rather than go to the primary health care centre. Yeah, I, 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 let, let me also say, I don't like to put money forward in anything I say because I believe that uh, the problem with our country is not money. I don't think it's money. I don't even think that uh, by contrast it is the misapplication of money not used properly. What is lacking in our country is information ideas to do things right. You know, on the one side, there is supply of primary care not adequate. And if, for example, I look at my primary care in my village, for example, I went there a few days ago and it was the pick of the repair. And I asked somebody to please help me, tell me how much it cost to put it back to action. And it cost, it, the total cost to give to me is not more than three million doing it properly to repair it. And uh, I told myself that any government or any person can provide three million to repair this. On the other hand, many primary health care services are not fully cheap. Some of them are free. So saying that our people don't have money, that's the reason why they don't go to primary health cannot be correct, com completely correct. By contrast, even traditional methods of treatment that people use is not necessarily cheap. They still pay a lot for them. So it is lack of information and the strategic alignment of what needs to be done in terms of demand and supply that causes the problem we're having. There's very little information about primary care uh, service provision in this country. 
And I believe very seriously that uh, there has to be a, a real rotation, a political education for people, sorry, let me say healthcare education for people, uh, so that the healthcare centers can be improved, so okay. that in terms of supply, yeah. and also so that people can properly demand and use primary health center, rather than inappropriate sources of healthcare delivery. What is the current status of maternal, newborn, and child health in Nigeria, particularly from the perspective of the primary health care? Thank you. Uh, today in Nigeria, uh, there are about uh, recent reports from the World Health Organization, you know, in December 2015, indicates that uh, that's that what you may be hearing. Matter of mortality, number of women who in child but has not reduced in this country. It has not. By contrast, 45,000 women die every year in this country from pregnancy related complications. The data is actually show that Nigeria is second in terms of the actual number of deaths in this country to India. India is number one only because they have a large population. But in terms of the proportion of women who die, Nigeria is number one. In terms of numbers of women who die during childbirth, Nigeria is number two. And secondly, we now know that Nigeria contributes about 15% to the global estimates of maternal and death. Nigeria is today regarded as one country where maternal mortality is extremely high. By contrast, when the millennial development goes to be in 2000 to 2015, we will go to ensure that about 75%, uh, there's a reduction by 75% of maternal death. The promise was there that Nigeria would achieve it. But Nigeria was one country that did not. And I want to tell you, there's only one state in Nigeria, only one state that achieved the million development goals, and that was in this state. Based on the fact that that state emphasized primary care. And today, there are, there are five states that are doing very well in primary care activities. Lagos State, um, Ondo State, Jigawa State, Adia State. Majority of states, based on the indicators that the Foreign Ministry of Health has established, are not doing too well. And uh, I can tell you that if governments were to focus on primary care and improve access to our people, both for mother, newborn, and child health, I can tell you that there's significant reduction in number of deaths. And if there's a significant reduction, Nigeria will not benefit because the international community will see that uh, all of the indicators are improving because the truth is that when you talk about the comparison between states and countries, it is not the amount of per capita income that you have that determines that. Rather, it is the things like maternal mortality indicator, the extent to which women survive during pregnancy. That's exactly what people use to compare the extent to which countries are performing in the development industry. Today, Nigeria is not performing well. Just by the fact that our economies are supposed to be the biggest in Africa, yet we are recorded as one country where development is not happening because our women and children die inevitably, you know, in, 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 at their times of their lives. And for children, for example, Nigeria has 75, 750,000 babies, less than five years of age. 750, about a few years ago it was one million. But now we've been able to reduce it to about 750,000 babies who are less than five years of age, die every year in this country. Which is almost like the population of the country. Mm. You know, and we are giving back to children who are damaged, you know, more children are damaged, who may have problems because, you know, where they are born, they are not properly delivered. And we are also giving back to babies who are infected with child use because of the inadequacy of our health care delivery system. So, my advocacy is for primary health care to be improved at all levels. There will be tremendous benefit in terms of access to health care services for our country. Well, what's, what's the current policies uh, as at least the private health care in Nigeria and to what extent do you think these policies can help to galvanize improving maternal, newborn and child health in this country? Yeah, at the federal government level, the, clearly the federal government is promoting primary health care. They came up with, with policy on primary health care under one roof, which uh, is currently consisting of nine indicators. One of the things they did is to decentralize, to say that states should establish state primary health care development agencies and then give them the nine indicators of performance, which are currently being assessed. For example, a district is supposed to have a district primary health care development agency passed into law. You know, national, the state assembly is supposed to pass into law. Unfortunately, today, we know that a district has not passed that particular bill into law. They are still debating it. So that means that in terms of the performance of a district in the state primary health care development index, which the federal government has put to be. A district scored at the beginning scored only 
at 2014, out of 100. In 2015, they scored uh, 13%, only because uh, Governor Shumala signed the bill. But now I'm told that the bill has been returned to the State House Assembly for a discussion. I'm also told that the current Governor is insisting that that law must be discussed immediately and passed. So that if there was to be an enforcement today, a day still would be scoring lower than 13%, which is not good enough. And I am very quite concerned because I think that title being at home, I'm from a district. <laughs> and I'm concerned that Panama Health Development relationship in this state ought to do well. And if I were the government, the only thing I need to so let me not say the only thing I have to do, yeah. even on the major things I should do for health in this yeah. state, uh, is to just improve the Panama Health Care system. It will have a reverberity effect on the entire health care system in this state. Because that means that if people were to use Panama Health Care services, the burden on secondary care services, such as central hospital, uh, you know, uh, 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 UBTH, it will be significantly reduced. And those two hospitals will then be able to perform better in terms of, you know, the quality of services that they provide. Okay. Right? Right. okay. Uh, let, let me just um, take an excerpt of uh, some statistics here. Maybe Prof will give us some more uh, in-depth analysis on this. It says, of the 7 million babies born in Nigeria every year, over 260,000 die within the first month of life, and nearly 300,000 die, uh, 300,000 are stillborn, with nearly 90,000 deaths in the first 24 hours of life. Mm -hmm. Nigeria has the second highest burden of first day uh, deaths in the world, or a 9% of the global total. In addition, 40,000 women, 30,000 women die from pregnancy and childbirth complications each year. So when we have this kind of statistics, then you're wondering, over the years, what has the policy thrust of the government been and how have this, because you commended the federal government for having a robust primary health care uh, policy, so to speak. Yes, I think the policy has always been there to promote, in fact, to promote primary health care, right from the very foundational beginning. Uh, almost like, let me say, 20 years. Almost every government has you know, has prioritized primary health care in terms of the health care delivery system. But unfortunately, policies are often different from implementation. The policies are there, but the extent to which uh, governments have implemented some of the policies that they have has not been very impressive. I can almost tell you that the political will to drive policies on health has been very daunting, or hasn't been very deep. Uh, throughout this country, because health, to me, what I've seen is that to many uh, political actors and political leaders in this country, are my own understanding that they don't see health as a, pol as a visible form of development. Some of you can see fish to say they are performed. Mm. By contrast, if they are building roads and constructive buildings, those can easily be seen. But if they are providing a certain health care system to their people, and less people are dying, people might not know that they are contributing. And that's the reason why most of the time the political will to provide health care, especially primary health care, you know, is often not very, uh, it's not there. Mm. But I want to tell you that everything we do in development is there towards improving health. If we are going to construct a road, it is because we want our people to, to, to live better. If we are improving health, if we are, if we are improving uh, education, at the end of the day, it has an impact, impact on health. We find out the standing up in terms of why we are alive, is to be alive. Yeah. And everything we do, you know, what government does is to promote health so that we can live, and when we are living and living well, yeah. you know, we can contribute better to uh, societal development. So my advice is that governments must not ignore health as a foundational area where they should contribute to. Okay. Because it is why we are alive. It is yeah. the reason why countries live, and it is the reason why countries are different from the others. The quality of living and the quality of health the time is different between, for example, Nigeria and, you know, and Ghana and so on and so forth. And that is what we should try and promote and not ignore it altogether. Okay. Um, what, is, what is your ideal primary health care system like? Let's, let's begin, I mean, if I, if I go to Ewu, for example, and I find the primary health care <laughs> there, what are the ideal um, equipment, facilities and personnel that we should find there. Now, I want to tell you that the Federal Minister of Health has a compendium on what facilities should be present in primary health centers. 
will come out with a detailed if I look at the details, it's extreme including even the physical space, the type of building, the presence of light, water, emergency, uh, uh, for example, emergency transport, so that if a woman has a serious complication that cannot be managed. Maybe like an ambulance. Like an ambulance. You know, availability of drugs, essential drugs, etc. All of those are being compiled by the Federal Minister of are made available and the ability to also compile similar lists. In fact, the list of the foreign minister is, is in compliance with that of, of the federal government. So, and then of course, when I, I'm currently doing a survey, by the way, in two local governments, uh, Isako East and then uh, Isha uh, Southwest, Southeast local government. Just going to, in Isha and Southeast local government, there are 27 primary care, in the first center, primary care centers. In Isako East, they have 27. And so I'm currently assessing the 56 primary centers in two local governments and doing an inventory of the system to see how many of them, how many of the equipment that have been uh, identified by federal government, how many of these primary centers have a modicum of these facilities. Just a minimum. Just a minimum. We're not talking about everywhere. Just, just that. a minimum. Okay. And I'm going to publish the studies. Mm. I'm starting. I've done the questionnaire. I have not done it, but I can tell you that in the next one or two months, that information will be available. To tell you the extent to which our primary care centers have been ignored, have been abandoned over the years. You know, so that is such a pity because unless we show some statistics, mm. people will not know the extent to which our primary care have been, uh, let me use the word, uh, abandoned, or the least they are suffering from uh, lack of, um, you know, improvement, etc. And that's really, way, those are the time I help the government to be able to think. And indeed, I want to tell you also that. What the Prime Minister of Health has done is to provide the minimum requirement. And if I uh, what I will do, I will ask the student who I'm calling one of my students to a master's in economics, health economics, to calculate the cost of providing those equipment from A to Z. And then I'll I'll find out of, of the primary centers currently we are going to visit. I'm going to see how many facilities we have and then what is the gap and then calculate the gap, how much the government needs to pay to be able to fund and equip <laughs> And I want to tell you that it will not be that much. <laughs> if funds are provided yeah. and are adequately used, adequately used, the funding of primary care per unit should not be excessive. Okay, please. That's what I want to prove. Would you, would you agree with that? Um, because you said you don't usually like, you don't like to talk about money because you believe that money is not the problem. But would you agree that um, under the circumstances, funding is a major challenge from the prospect, perspective of budget because every every year year in year out there is a budget and then of course you look at sectoral allocation then you look at health specifically would you say you know we've been doing well in terms of uh, UN standard WHO standard in terms of budgeting for health my I want to say I want to emphasize the fact that and I want to say that I've said it so many times my friends that money is not the problem it is the proper use of money that is the problem that is the truth. Again, if uh, I'm going to do that for you to prove to people that if between today, if you wanted to pick properly a primary care center in a, in a particular primary care center in a district, you don't need a substantial amount of money. By contrast, what is not more important in this country is the idea and the willingness and determinism to do something right. It is not the money. If I want to calculate how much you need to prepare a primary center, in a part of a district, I will tell you that we don't need more than three or four million dollars if the money is properly used. If it is properly used and directed to what is supposed to be done. So, and I have told you that when I was advised to uh, President Abbasid on Health, I was asked to calculate how much it would cost a state to provide free maternal and child health services. And we did the calculation. And at the end of the day, we got the heart. We found out that. The state really need to have more than five million dollars per month to provide free matter and child services if it is effectively done. And I know about a few states subsequently started providing free matter and child services. And I, th I visited the state and I found that the state was giving something like 75 million dollars a month. Yet, the quality of services in that state was abysmally low and poor. And there was no evidence that that state, that money that the state was devoting, was being used appropriately for what supposed to be so my impression about this country is not money, as the sister said that it's money. By contrast, is the willingness to do things right 
the, the willingness to have a policy and drive it right and be patriotic about implementing it. That is the problem of this country. Because I've been to other countries, for example, the money they are allocated for services on earth are not much more than the Nigeria are cook. Yet, they have better service delivery mechanisms. In Nigeria, we allocate a lot of money, we budget money, we release money. Yet, the quality of communication is poor. That is where the problem should be. And hospitals and teaching us and all that cannot tell me that the problem they have is very money. The ability to deliver services in a pathetic manner, that is the, to me, that is the challenge in this country. If you just join us, the program is TMI. I told you at the beginning that this is going to be thought-provoking, uh, looking at family health care and providing maternal, newborn, and child health, and how we can improve it using the family health care uh, model, so to speak. And uh, we've been talking with a global professor of obstetrics and gynecology, currently the Vice Chancellor of the State University of Medical Sciences, our very own Professor Friday O'Connor is sharing some thoughts with us, really nice statistics. Um, he's firmly on the ground that um, the challenge with the health sector is not about money, but the political will to deploy, discuss resources to meet the needs of the people, particularly at the rural areas. Now, I'll press quickly. Um, it looks like the major part of these challenges in terms of access to health is resident in the rural areas. How do we how do we how do we enhance, how do we improve what is happening at the rural area? Because you find instances even where these family health care facilities are available, some of those rural people don't want to go there, they don't want to use it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that with the, what we, it means that there used to be the philosophy of governance whereby you try to build the gap between rural and urban communities. Today, it is known that all of those indicators you read out are worse in rural communities as compared to urban communities. The women who die in this country for pregnancy, most of whom are those in rural communities who are not affected with care. They are the poor women, they are the women who are unemployed, and they are the richest, not only in rural communities. So, if we Govern, if government is governed by the need to provide social equity, then we must selectively focus on the most disadvantaged parts of our country, especially our communities. We should not ignore them. There's a propensity and the tendency to ignore them. So that if we are going to talk about family care and if family care is going to be effective with using matter and type, then we must focus on rural communities. Rural communities. Because in the other centers, they have access to private clinics that are available, they have access to general hospitals, specialist hospitals, and so on and so forth. They have access to telephone calls, they can make the people like me and say, please, I have somebody I want to speak to. By contrast, the rural communities don't have access. Mm. So let me tell you this. You've made a very important point, and I want to emphasize it, that if we are desirous of having an egalitarian society, a society that is based on social equity, that promotes equality, because the problem in Nigeria is social inequality that can lead to a lot of problems. In future, if we, the, the way Nigeria is going and is being governed, if we continue like that, the gap between the rich and poor will continue to widen. We continue to widen, and all those things we are talking about insecurity, disenchantment, you know, what they call, uh, you know, what they call it, all sorts of things will be happening. But if we focus our governance to ensure that those who are most marginalized, who are at the greatest risk, are provided social safety nets. Especially those in rural communities, I can tell you that that's the way to go this country. That's the way to be. We have not started it, but if we do start, if we take our several years to equalize, to even begin to, you know, cover the gaps, but to begin is now. Those rural communities, if you, if you like, let go and shut up the com I'm going to do a paper, and when I finish that paper, I'm going to make it a resource available to the government in terms of the state of our permanent service in rural locations. I'm going to talk to people, I'm going to hold community conversations with leaders in the community to see what the problem is. I'm going to do focus group discussions and these papers or uh, these results will be ready by let me say uh, by September, October, November. And I will invite NTV, ITV to cover it. Okay. So that I will hope that the results will help our state government and focus on a district. Primarily because charity begins at home. Mm. And, if, and the results from a district can be used in other states to, to, to improve the health of the to respect to primary care. 
All right. Uh, but, um, what do you make of, I mean, it's neon for years. Like you, you admitted just now, I mean, there are some individuals who could make a phone call to you to need, I mean, need your service and stuff like that. But we have even taken that up a little bit by um, having what we now call medical tourism. People have a scratch in the ear, they go abroad. Is it that a, 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 an, an, an indictment on uh, you know, professionals like you who abound in, in different parts of the country? Unfortunately, when they get to the U.S. and U.K., you will find out that the people that attend to them are still Nigerians like us who attend to them in the U.K., who are still there. Right and then secondly, you find out that the people that attend to them are no more, if they study very well, they find out they are no more qualified than us. And so on and so forth. So I don't think it's an indictment. It's an indictment of the belief that we have in our healthcare system, belief system. And I actually know that the propensity to go outside has increased over the years. In the good old days, we used to have them come to us. But more and more, with Nigeria becoming rich in future and with the inequality in death, I think the major factor is some people believing they have money. And that the rest of us who don't have money can be, you know, can be suppressed, socially and psychologically. It is not that, uh, you know, it is not that uh, they don't know that some of these, you know, conditions can be treated here in this country. And our uh, parties in the UK, I found a lot of Nigerians who came there with conditions that, at the end of the day, it was the Nigerian expert them. I also found out that some of them didn't have any particular uh, reason to come on board and so on and so forth. So, I think that, uh, to my mind, at the end of the day, people have the right to seek treatment. They have their fundamental rights. Once well, they have the resources. Once they have the resources. Mm. So we really don't, uh, cannot have, to me, we don't, we don't have any right to begin to get, uh, grass, uh, begin to worry about where people uh, have treatment. But the truth is that, you know, there are things that you need to do when the condition becomes bad, even those in the UK cannot help you. Uh, and they cannot help you. And some people have been referred back from the UK to come back to Nigeria to see the second healthcare system you are trying to avoid. And because their conditions have got to a certain stage, that even them are there cannot manage it. So we need a proper education for people, proper health communication, promotional activities, so that we know what to do. That at the end of the day, going to outside the country uh, may or may not uh, be helpful. Okay. And okay. Um, quickly, you, you, we have a lot of research institutions in Nigeria. I mean, um, health institutions that are churning out research outcomes every now and then, like you've been talking about, you know, what you're currently working on, you said between September and October, that uh, document or your findings should be made public mm. for everyone, uh, for anyone who cares to listen, who cares to read it and all of that. There seems to be a disconnect between the research libraries, the research centers like WAC and a host of others, and the larger society, particularly the government, the policy makers. How do we bridge that gap? Because that seems to be where the challenge is. How do we bridge that gap? Thank you. That's a very important question. I, you know, that is very, and that's part of why I'm on TV today, by the way. Because most of what I'm saying now is uh, based on the research I've conducted. There needs to be strategic communication of uh, research uh, outcomes so that policy makers can use them. There are two problems. One is the policy makers often don't demand research to be able to inform their policy making. By contrast, the researchers also are not able to present the results of their research in a manner that policy makers understand. So that marriage, today I'm also doing some work on that. I'm actually doing a training workshop in July, you know, here at the University of Dini, to, you know, bring the policy makers and the fellow together and then to begin to think about how to uh, bridge that particular gap. I tell you that uh, political making, uh, policy making in this country is definitely not driven by the research resource. And I can tell you, but I also know from what I have interaction with some policy makers that if the researcher provides the resource in a manner that he can understand and then makes it policy relevant, you don't just do any type of research, but they strategically focus their research on answering some important uh, policy questions, you know, and then providing those results to policy makers in a very particular manner. I'm also aware that policy makers will be willing to use the results. And plan. So I believe that research should be integrative. That means that researchers should not just do it alone. They must ensure that policy makers at the beginning of the research know. That's the reason why I'm talking about the work I'm going to do 
in uh, in uh, Ifaco if and uh, if I am not uh, local government because I believe that uh, by them understanding that that is how we are available in the future, knowing how our farm workers are currently are and knowing how much it will cost to improve them, mm. that government as soon as the world becomes available, they know that doing that research, as soon as the research becomes available, we will also start to directly communicate with them that they will then use it to provide. The important thing is that the solutions to provide by a researcher provide should be easy to understand. They should be simple and it should be cost effective. And that's why policy makers will use them. But if you come out and use high quality terms, you know, very complicated uh, car square terms, etc., to describe the research results, I'm telling you that policy makers will, be, will not be able to use them. And then you must tell them how much it will cost. So I'm going to talk about panel centers. I'm going to talk about the gaps. I'm going to talk about the costs to government of doing the repairs in those financial centers. So there are some no contractor will come and say the cost is 50 million naira when it is actually 2 million naira. Because then the government will see the benefit that, oh, it's only 2 million naira, let's see. So, and we can test it. Mm. We've tested the, the work women said are actually the I've tested a, 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 a program whereby the Tiwa Bangma Foundation provided funds, simple funds for us to repair financial centers in all our local government. And we go there, we need to see what it was like before. And what is it is now. And the cost. Sounds it fantastic. And now for our negotiating a bar hole, seeking a bar hole in one of the power centers. And although the cost was about uh, 400,000 naira, and we are still a season because we are telling the person it's not 400,000 naira, it's 350,000 naira one day. So that we know that we want to be sure that that bar hole is not more expensive than the normal bar hole. By contract, if a contractor was doing that very for a government, he would say two million dollars. That's the problem. That's the problem we're having. So I'm telling you that these things are not going to be the government will listen to you when you are doing a type of research that answers some of the questions that government research is, is asking. Okay. All right. Uh, presented in a way that government can understand. Okay. A, a, a while ago you, you gave us um um, statistics of some of the available data on the current uh, status of uh, maternal, newborn, and child health. Uh, do you have such statistics uh, about uh, the state? Uh, were those statistics responsible for your current work in some of the two in this local government that you highlighted a while ago? Well, I must tell you that the statistics we have are not community-based statistics. Okay. We have institutional statistics, for example, for we dictate, we have statistics on maternal deaths, number of deliveries, but those institutional statistics do not represent the entire state. Okay. Because this is represent only women who contribute it, and they are usually maybe women who are privileged. The same thing, if central hospital are to provide statistics, we have statistics for Iraq hospital, we have for central hospital, we have for the other hospital. In, uh, so, those are institutional hospitals. What we need are community-based statistics, because only about, let me say, only about 40, in fact, only about 40 percent of pregnant women deliver in hospitals. In 40 percent, so the other 60 percent, what did they get delivered? They deliver either at home, especially those in rural communities, or they deliver uh, with traditional birth attendants, or they go to food-based uh, centers, you know, there are some centers that are currently run by churches, they go there. And those statistics can never be captured. Okay. So if you want to know exactly what's happening in those states, you need community-based data. And again, we are doing a similar study. I'm not aware of too many. I know I'm aware of data collected in local states for uh, community-based rates of maternal deaths. You know, using a particular method. I'm aware of some other than in parts of the country state, for example. But I'm not aware that a community-based data is used for those states. Mm. You know, and that's why. For example, I know that about a couple of years back, I think it was the governor, the Indian uh, government, other uh, government, that established a uh, state monitoring committee. You know, whether it was made compulsory that uh, number of deaths should be recorded. Mm. You know, very uh, pregnancy. But I'm not aware that the results have been published. That's an important intervention, and I want to I want to appeal to the current government to put matter mortality on its high flying banner. It will prevent. It will. It will show us a lot of things, and if there's one of the major things you can do for health, to me that's a very important matter to be addressed in this case. Well, we're just on the verge of uh, cutting me up on our discussion of primary health care 
providing maternal, uh, newborn, and child health, improving it actually with uh, Professor Friday O'Connor. Uh, some say um, life expectancy in Nigeria has drastically reduced. Um, well, the current economic situation is also not helping matters. What is your, what are your key recommendations uh, in, in view of the current economic challenges, particularly in helping uh, Nigerians to have quality health despite building resources, so to speak? Thank you very much. I think there is a connection between health and uh, economic well-being of, of people, and, uh, and there are so many ways in which economics impact on health. Especially the demand for quality healthcare. And you know, both those who, when the economy is bad, then there's a high frequency of diseases, let me say of illnesses, just because of malnutrition that people uh, experience. And then the ability to handle the diseases also diminishes. And then more importantly, when they are ill, they are not able to seek. In fact, the fear of, some people believe that hospitals are expensive. They just see it, they say, ah, this is the expensive. But the truth is that they may not necessarily be expensive. So they may not necessarily be expensive. And there are mechanisms in hospitals where if a patient cannot afford a, in a particular treatment and yet the patient has to survive, hospitals will waive treatment, will waive costs of treatment. There is no single hospital I know that will not waive cost of treatment if that treatment is very important to the survival of that patient. So the economy is a very major determinant of some of the outcomes in terms of life expectancy that we are experiencing. But uh, and that's the reason why I'm saying that when the economy is bad, that's the more reason why we should focus, we should focus more on health. We should prioritize that because, you know, you should realize that when the economy is bad, more people get ill. More people are not able to have, afford the service. If, for example, uh, the cost of uh, treatment hospitals should be that kind of reduced for people, so that we can fix it. Yeah. For example, in uh, in this state, I can tell you that uh, material care services are free. Then now we may come to our hospital as a teaching hospital. They receive the most sophisticated treatment, including civilization, without paying a dime. I'm telling you. And uh, we co- calculated the cost. It's not, it's not prohibitive. It is well done. And for that reason, people are no longer going to be thinking about if I'm pregnant, what do I do? And so on and so forth. And therefore, their ill health is a major fundamental problem of the country that government should be concerned about. It's already the means. So my plea is that when the economy is, 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 is not good, mm. then governments may realize that people are going to be more sick and that if they are more sick, they are less likely to seek appropriate treatment. And therefore, they should provide some form of support or safety net to communities to be able to access. They should be able to advise. There is a way they can do it. Isn't this, it, can do it. isn't this what the National Health Insurance Scheme is supposed to uh, uh, take care of? All? Yes. National Health Insurance Scheme is supposed to do that. But you know that national insurance is, is one of the most inefficient insurance schemes in the world today. And Nigerian healthcare, Nigerian national healthcare system has been very, very badly managed. You know that. You know that today only about four percent of people have access to national healthcare and national health insurance. And many of these four percent are those who are privileged, who are employed in the civil service. That comes as those who really need it. Those are those in rural communities don't have access to it. And it's not working. Really, between them, it's not working. The national health insurance has not worked, and it's not working. If I was, if I was, the government of this state must do something specific to protect the lives of our, our women, children, and men. They should, national health insurance, yes, they should try and improve it in for the future. But as it is today, it is not working. We should not rely on it completely. And if uh, the state government, I will not rely on it. I would rather look for my own state health insurance scheme for my people and see whether it can ally with the national health insurance or do something completely unique and major to protect, uh, so that it may be expensive, but for the people, it may be health care may be expensive, but a state must design its own mechanisms because national health care insurance is policy it has not worked. It has not worked. But we hope it works. Okay. Uh, on, on a final note, um, there are a couple of bottlenecks that um, impact negatively on healthcare delivery. Summarily, what are these bottlenecks and what are your key recommendations? The bottlenecks are, you know, first of all, the policy environment 
uh, and prioritization of health care. And the extent to which uh, the budget that, even though we know that the demand is not enough, the extent to which the funds are properly used. Then the demand for health care, the extent to which people actually demand and use the available health services. And the proper management of the health care system. I can tell you, proper management of the health care system to make sure that it's effective and that it meets the needs of the majority of the people. It's also very important. And then health information, data gathering. The, what we are talking about, matter mortality and child mortality, is, is just estimates. Nobody is absolutely sure whether the figures are correct or not correct. We need a health information system that accurately documents the number of deaths and deaths in this country. That has happened in many other countries of the world. Nigeria is not a country that has a data uh, data quality, uh, mechanism. And then to add them. I also will recommend that for matter mortality, we should have a confidential inquiry into matter and death. So that every matter and death that occurs in a country or in a state will be investigated. And the cause of death identified. In a no blame manner. We're not saying we should investigate in order to put somebody in jail. <laughs> we are going to have to find out why the man died and then provide solutions okay. to prevent another death from happening. And that's what is done in the UK. The convenient inquiry of mother death has been in the UK from the 19, uh, whatever, 1920s. And it's still present today. And when I was in Sweden, and I did my page in Sweden, and I asked the only woman died over the last, the year I was in Sweden, only one woman died in the whole of Sweden, mm -hmm. the entire one year. And then they set up a big inquiry, which was... To find out what the possible woman dead. It was aired on television. They were looking carefully. Everybody was glued to the office to know why this man died. And at the end of the day, they found out that the woman died from a condition that was difficult to treat. They call it uh, air embolism. They had air that uh, went to blood vessels as a died from it. And then they kept the quiet. And from that, they started asking questions. What is this air embolism? Why can we reduce it? Why will I will my air embolism? They started discussing it. And Sweden so today has one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. So, Nigeria, we cannot say to do something like that. We should not allow our people. When I hear a pregnant woman dying or a child dying, I cry. I cry. I'm telling the truth. I cry because our women should not die just because they're doing that. It is not right. I cry. So, I think that we are the better match. We need political will, high level political will. If I was the person who focus, the health system of a country must not be left to the rules and caprices of people. It should be one of the foundational principles of governance. And it should be so well positioned that the highest government, level of governance at the national level, the president must be tuned to the health care problems of this country. He must be aware and he must speak about it from time to time. Show the state government. They should be attuned to it, they should be knowledgeable about it, they should be able to speak to it because once the government talks about health care in the particular state, everybody in that state, every health care provider, they are paying attention to wrong. Just by talking, you will reduce problems by almost 50%. Yeah. Just say something, go on television to say, a lot of expectancy is too, is too short, we should increase it. Everybody will focus. The same time we need it for us to address this problem. All right, thank you very much. I've been talking with uh, a Colin Global Professor Friday Konofwa, the Vice Chancellor of the State University of Medical Science. They shared some thoughts with us, and uh, at some point it really went emotional. You can understand that. But I want to thank you for your time with us on the program and the useful insight that you shared with us on the program, which is for the benefit of everyone, government, uh, legislators, name it, everybody is involved. It will just do the needful uh, deploy responses, have the political way, life expectancy will increase. I mean, there's nothing wrong if we have life expectancy in a district, for example, greater than what we have in, in the national figure. Nothing is wrong with that, absolutely. Prof, many thanks again for this for you. Thank you so much thank for coming on the program. It's the TMI Monday. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with you with the rest of the discussions on TMI. Mm -hmm. Don't go away.